Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're looking at the Beast and by Beast I'm referring to the uh, the Nikon F5. This is their uh, professional level camera. Well, it was their professional level camera. Introduced in 1996 and followed on from the F4 and this was replaced by the F6 in uh, 2004. So yeah, 96 to 2004. Very large, very heavy, 1.2 kilos just for the body. Um, for the first time has a built-in grip, um, which is what holds the batteries. We'll put those in in a minute. But yeah, this is the sort of um, dust-resistant, weather-resistant professional camera that would have been used by um, working professionals. And really anybody who wanted a very rugged, very tough um, camera. Um, this is a film camera, by the way, although it does look like a digital camera, it's very similar to, um, I have a D3, um, which looks very similar to this and a very similar kind of layout. Designed by the same Italian guy who did the F3 and the F4. So that's why there's a very striking similarity between all of these models. But yeah, it is, it is a very, very heavy camera, especially when you put a longer lens on it. But for sports action and wildlife, and uh, if you want to be a pap, then this is the, the camera to go for, or one of the cameras to go for. Um, and the reason for that is, is because it can shoot up to eight frames a second. So eight frames a second with a 36 exposure roll of film, that's what, four and a bit seconds, and you've gone through the whole roll of film. So it's, uh, it's a bit crazy, really. And it's an autofocus camera as well. Um, this one has uh, five autofocus points, um, one, in the, one in the middle, and that's surrounded by four, one at the top, one at the bottom, one left and one right. And that, that is all it has. It's an F-mount camera, so it takes most of the F-mount lenses. This is the release button here. Uh, it's the opposite to Canon, I always get these confused. You can see this one's wearing a G lens. Um, this camera will work with G lenses with all its functionality, unlike the F4. Uh, it also supports vibration reduction, so even though it's quite an old camera, it still works with uh, all the, the current F mount lenses, and it won't work with the Z mount lenses. That's a completely different system. So, on the front here, underneath this cover, we have a PC connection for studio flash or for connecting your flash with a cable. As I said, this is the, the lens lock button here. Down here we have the focus select, whether you want to do single, continuous focus, or whether you want to manually focus. You can use um, manual focus AI lenses. It has the AI coupling prong up here, which couples with, uh, have an AI lens here. It couples with a notch on the back of the lens. I'll put that there, you can see it more clearly. There's a notch here, and that couples to the camera to tell it what aperture you've selected. Unlike the F3, though, it doesn't fold out of the way, so you can't use pre AI lenses with this one like you can on the F3. On this side, we have a mirror lockup, so this would lock the mirror up out of the way. You can see there's a secondary mirror there as well which will come to that with the metering system. So there you can see in the throat with the mirror locked up. And this button here is a depth of field preview, which is electrical, although it is mechanical as well, but it can also stop down this lens, for example. There's no mechanical couplings at all. Or oh, tell a lie there is actually. This one here. We have a front control wheel on top of this grip. Here we have the, turn it around this way, it makes it a bit easier. Here we have the, uh, the on off switch. It also illuminates the, uh, the LCD. You can tell it's a professional camera because every control has got a lock on it so that nothing can move when you put it in a bag or whatever. And this is so you can set the camera up how you want it set up and you know it's going to stay like that. So if I push this button down, that goes into the oh, batteries. This is the battery pack. This one takes eight, the double A's. This just slots in the bottom. Secure the catch. So there we see it in the on position. This is a display. Um, there's no lens on it, so that's why it's not displaying any F numbers. So 
settings back on. So you can see f5.6 low because there's a lens cap on. There's a fifth at 5.6. And like I said, you can illuminate the, uh, the LCD. It lights up. So, uh, battery and information is this one here. And this is your frame counter. And it's only saying that it's empty. Here you can see the um, the AF points. There's one in the middle, one at the top, one at the bottom, left and right. And you can scroll through these using this wheel on the back. There's like a, a wheel part at the back here. And that enables you to scroll through the AF points. And this is the mode. And this is aperture priority. So to change the mode, literally push down on the mode button there's manual program and shutter priority so it has all the usual PASM modes I call them so it has all of those sort of modes to it this one is to select the AF point you can see that it's moving around I normally leave it just leave it on the center which is that one there but yeah, there's only the five AF points, not like the new Sony's and that where you've got a thousand of them or whatever covering the whole frame. Multiple exposures, you can push this button to do your multiple exposures. And this one over here is exposure compensation. So everything you need is well at hand. There's a rear control wheel here, lug straps, AF on, back button AF. And we have an exposure lock and an AF lock. And there is some custom menus, so you can um, customize these. Film plane indicator on here. Dioptic adjustment for those of us that wear glasses, so we can take the glasses off or lose them on. And this selects the, uh, the metering mode. And we have three different kinds of metering. We have spot metering. We have 3D color matrix metering. This camera has a 1,005 bit RGB, 1,005 pixel RGB sensor. So as well as metering your exposure, it also makes note of the colors. And that's, it does that to make sure you, you can get as accurate an exposure as possible. And then it also has a traditional center weight metering as well. The color matrix is the, is the preferable one to use. On some lenses, I think on some of the older manual focus lenses, it defaults to um, center weight, I believe. We have a hot shoe, which is dedicated for Nikon flashes. On this side, we still have a manual rewind. There's still a fold out, to, a fold out manual crank. And surrounding that at the bottom here, we have the shooting mode where there is a single, a single shot. We have continuous low, continuous high. We have a so-called silent mode. And we have a self-timer as well on that. So again, there's a lock on it. It won't move. Once it's in a position, it's locked. So to open the back, again, a lock. It is the traditional pull up, but there's a, there's a lock on that. Yeah. I'm going to take this off because it kind of gets in the way. A long time since I've dropped anything on the floor. On the back here, we have a blind. If we're not having our eye up to it so it doesn't confuse the metering with the light coming in through the, uh, the viewfinder part here. And obviously, this is a removable prism. There's a little catch here that you can push in. If you've got decent nails and it will slide backwards he says and then you can you can take the prism off there is a waist level finder and there is a high level um, sort of magnifying finder as well for it and this just slots back in he says if you can find the slot there we go. So to open the back, you have to move the little catch over and then pull up on this. And then the back opens up. And in the back here, you can see it's got a clear window so you can see what film you've got loaded. It's 
spring to hold the cassette in, the pressure plate, the guide rollers, very heavy duty as you can see, take up spool, sprocket drive, here's the shutter, the shutter's quite clever, it self diagnoses and also measures its, uh, its own times and adjusts um, itself automatically, I don't know what the life expectancy of them is but uh, they seem fairly tough, I assume they're titanium. This is where your film's going to go, and here you can see the sensors for the DX coding. So it can read the film speed off of the cartridge, but uh, you can manually overwrite that. So that's the inside of the camera. And so on the back you've got this sort of thumb wheel control for moving the focus points. There's a cover that goes over the top of here, I've taken one off because it keeps falling off. And uh, here's some extra buttons. So the ISO selection is down here. So you just push the ISO button and you can select your ISO manually. So in the manual mode, it goes from ISO 6 to ISO 6400. And DX code, it can read from 25 to 5000. But normally with things like um, A colour negative film I like to overexpose so I don't tend to use the DX coding part of it. I always tend to put an extra stop and light onto it. So here we have the flash selection so we can decide whether we want the first sort of bit of the what they call first curtain, second curtain, etc. On there with the flash. We have some custom functions here. Those will be a subject for another video because I guess it's a bit too complicated once you get into that. And this is the, the bracketing, this one down here. And I can't remember what this lock one does. It's not one I've used very often. I'll be honest, I'll just use the camera. More functions than I ever need. This down here hides a 10 pin connector for things like invalometers, etc. Although there was an invalometer back available for this as well. But yeah, this is a, a connection. The, this camera also stores EXIF type of data for each picture taken. And there is a computer program, or there was, that you could tie into the camera to get that information out. Um, I, don't, I think this camera's probably full of information. I don't know if it's ever been emptied. I certainly have never emptied it. I've never really taken this cover off, but that's what that's there for. And then to rewind the film, because it has a electronic rewind, it's a two-stage process. You lift up this button or this cover. There's a button underneath it. And then there's another one up here. They've both got locks on them. You can see the red light flashing up there to rewind the film. On the bottom, ooh, you see it's well-worn. Uh, just a tripod mount, and that's it. It's all metal. It is as heavy as a tank, to be honest. Right, let's pop a film in there. So remembering to open the back up, we'll push that across, pull up to open the back. It should stand on its nose. So we get a roll of film. Good old Kodak gold. So your film goes in this way. And you drop your film in. Oh, some of my fingers and thumbs today. You can see that there's a spring here. It is quite, uh, it's quite well held in there. I think that's probably relating to the uh, this eight frames a second malarkey. I can get this fold out either out of the way, it would help. And there's the film goes in. All you've got to do, this is quite an easy camera to load, he says, is pull the film across to there. And you would normally close the back and that would hold that in place. But you can also do it when it's open. And there you can see it's taking the film up. Close the back. And there it's on number one ready to go. And you can see the slack's been taken out of there. So let's see what it says for ISO. I didn't see if that was a 
Oh, they're saying 400 for that, which is wrong. It should be 200. Actually, it would be 100. I'll be shooting at but it doesn't matter. It's only a test wrong. So in aperture priority mode, you select your aperture. And with these lenses, your aperture is this front control ring here. So you can select your aperture. The shutter speeds on the camera range from 30 seconds through to an 8,000th of a second. And it's in third stop increments as well. And the same with the aperture. You've got the various apertures that you can dial in. And in aperture priority mode, it's going to select the, the corresponding shutter speed. I think you've already heard it. Here's the sound of the shutter. Well, that's quite loud. We change the uh, the mode. So I'm going to change this to manual. And uh, when you put it in manual mode, the back wheel is the shutter speed selector. So there's the shutter speed. And the front one is correspondingly the, the aperture. And just to show you the stop down. See, it stops down electronically. Right, I think that just about covers it now that you've all been waiting to see. I would guess is put it on that. I'm going to take the lens off so you can actually see what's uh, what's going on inside. This is on continuous high manual, a thousandth of a second. That's a whole film gone in an instant. And you can see that it's. Uh, a, it says end at the top, and the red light was flashing to tell you that it's reached the end of the film. And like I said, to rewind, you push down on that button, lift up on that one, and it rewinds the film. And that's that film exposed and rewound. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Absolutely ridiculous, really. But the sports of action and wildlife and such like, it's... Uh, it's the only way to go, really. These cameras new were very expensive. They were sort of five, six thousand pounds, sort of job like they all are. But now you can pick them up fairly reasonably. Um, this body cost me 125 pounds. That's in English money. Um, I think that's a really, really well spec camera for the price. To be honest, um, my FE when I bought that new was 250 pounds new. Um, okay, that was a new camera. But it just shows you, you know, what you can get for not a lot of money. If you've got Nikon glass, um, these are very nice cameras. They're very well built. Um, highly recommended. Um, bit of a beast. It's heavy. That's the only reason I could see for not buying one. Um, other than that, they're reliable. They're dependable. They're proven. I think they're better than the F6 in many ways. The F6 is lighter not quite as rugged and as tough as these ones a little bit smaller started to go backwards a bit well the f6 was the last of them i think this is the, the sort of the pinnacle of the f series really although i like the f the f2 the f3 i haven't had the f4 i haven't, I haven't tried the f4 that's one that i sort of bypassed because i got fairly modern excuse me nikon lenses that i wanted to use with a film camera and a digital camera and the f5 was a great choice to do that with so there we go folks that's today's camera the beast of a nikon f5 they don't work particularly well with third party lenses um the guy on granny days if any of you watch that channel he had an f5 and he was trying to use a sigma art lens on it and it wouldn't want to focus very well they don't work particularly well with um non-nikon lenses but the nikon lenses they work fine don't know why that is there's always this issue with sigma and tamron as well so if you do have those sort of lenses then yeah you might well run into issues with it but i only shoot with nikon lenses on this so uh, not a problem thank you very much for watching hope you've enjoyed and uh comments questions queries etc down below as normal 
please don't forget to like and subscribe and all that usual eBay stuff. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next one.